Hello, everyone. I'm Jean-Claude at Beyond Mystic, and welcome to this very special report. Today, the title is JFKX, the documentary Decode, with none other than Mr. J. Widener. You can find his work at jwidener.com, and also here, specifically on jfkx.org. Mr. Widener, J., welcome back to the show, and Happy New Year. How are you, man? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Happy New Year. Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Quite busy already. Uh, we're kicking off 2024 <laughs> in style and in vogue. And of course, there's a lot of news coming out in the last couple of days, making the term conspiracy theory uh, not so dirty anymore. <laughs> Jay, let's get into that a little bit here before we get into the show. Where do you see as things are going on now in the last couple of days here of January um, 1, 2, and 3 leading up to today? A lot's coming out. We're looking at the Epstein list also. Where do you think 2024 is going? Let's get into that a little bit here before we get into this decode with your amazing documentary here, the JFK X and solving the mystery of uh, the crime of the century. Jay. Uh, well, I, I personally know of a quite, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are uh, doing a lot of really incredible research and we talk among ourselves and I can tell you right now, there's a bunch of bombs about to be dropped. Um, on every level, not just politics, but cultural, science. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be unbelievable. And what it is, is like we talked about the last time, we're moving out of the Kali Yuga into the Dvarapara Yuga, and things that were you know, murky and indistinct are now becoming clear and in focus. And that's because we're, we're getting in more of this intergalactic uh, energies from the center of the galaxy and every day it gets bigger and better and we can see more and see more clearly. And I, don't know, I frankly, I think that my film JFKX is part of this. I think we couldn't see what we saw before, but right. now we can. And I think that's going to happen on so many different levels. And I myself am preparing to drop several bombs over the next month, month and a half um, that I'm just done. I, you know, I've reached this point where um, I'm too old to fool around with it, and I just want to get everything out. And I've just decided and talked it over with everybody that I know that knows what I'm talking about. And they said, "Yeah, let's do it. Let's just get it out. Let's just done with it. Let's let's get everything out now because um, because it's going to cause this ramification effect." You know, I, I, if I if I'm brave enough to say it, then somebody else will be brave enough to say it, and then pretty soon. It's the Spartacus, you know, I am Spartacus at the end of the movie, right? We're Everybody's starting up. We're all Spartacus. Yeah. But before I go on, I wanted to show you something. This is my new UAP detector. I <laughs> got this from uh, Chris O'Brien, the famous UFO writer, uh, developed this. It's a 360-degree camera here that I'm putting up on my roof. I have two of these. I'm putting them up this week. And it detects anything moving around in the sky. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to get some plasma bodies and UFOs and all that. And so I'll report to you back on what I discover as I put these up. But um, it's pretty exciting. Wow, so that's, that's another thing that's going on. Is uh, We're triangulating. Um, we have, we're going to have three outposts of these UAP detectors in southern Colorado, in which we'll be able to triangulate any sightings or anything that's seen. Uh, from three different positions. So that's kind of exciting. It's very exciting. And let me know if I can uh, help in any way putting this uh, information out once you've tested it. Yeah. And if you have uh, stories to tell, like that's going to be very fascinating to a lot of our audience members. And I know that for the most of us too, uh, and who've, who've followed my show, uh, they've listened to Cliff High looking out at the sky here with his uh, night vision goggles, everything they're yeah. seeing. So it's very encouraging that more and more people are paying attention to this. So we have the David Grushes of the world uh, testifying at uh, Congress, but nothing's going to happen until you and I actually get <laughs> part or everybody watching the show uh, get into this fight here and actually look up and do the opposite of that movie don't look up <laughs> yeah. so that was a great movie by the way if you guys haven't seen it, it was um, a great movie. yeah jay uh, before we start so first of all uh, let me go back here to the rumble feed there's people on youtube also thank you so much we're almost at 2000 watching there live um i want to get into the term conspiracy theorist before we go too far now 
um ostensibly and for people who are watching the show the the people who watch uh jay widener and reality check on youtube they're coming to the conclusion here that a lot of these conspiracy theories are now becoming conspiracy th fact time and time and time again we're on a winning streak here although we didn't get into it to win we just wanted to get into the truth but it turns out that yeah uh, the truth here is absolutely stranger than fiction so talk yeah. about where this term um originated and how actually that ties in to the JFK assassination. Yeah. So right now, the, if you're keeping score, it's conspiracy theorists 264 and non-conspiracy theorists are still at zero. So, um, you know, we're winning on every level. In fact, I don't even have to defend it anymore. I used to have to like go through this whole rigmarole of defending conspiracies and where they came from and why, how the CIA invented the term after the Kennedy assassination. But I don't even have to do that anymore. Everybody just knows it. And, yeah. um, and that's a big thing. So, yeah, so the, uh, the term conspiracy theory is a derogatory term because it, every journalist or anyone who wants to find out the truth is going to be looking at conspiracies because that conspiracies are anything by two or more people that are concocted in secret. Mm -hmm. So everything can be a conspiracy. My, my wife and I going to a movie can be a conspiracy between the two of us. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not going to tell the kids, right? We're going to go see this movie, right? So it, the whole term is ridiculous and stupid. And all it really did was ignite, as I point out in JFKX, all it, the, all it did was every time that they tried to downplay like conspiracies, all it does is just reignite it over and over. You'd think that they would learn to stop doing it because all it does is get everybody back into the game again. And I've been around long enough to watch it over and over the, in the JFK thing, you know, mm -hmm. would, there would be this huge surge of interest and it would die off. And then somebody would come out and say, oh, JFK was a womanizer. And then all of a sudden there'd be this big surge of interest again. And, yeah. and it was like, you guys, you guys keep trashing JFK. And they did for 60 years. Yeah. Only now are they coming out and saying, oh, he was a good guy and all that. That is BS. For the last 60 years, you guys have been putting out, I mean, all of the mainstream media has been putting out negative stories about JFK and him, him being a, a womanizer and in the mob and, and all of these things. And um, the only person besides him that's received that kind of negativity is Trump. Mr. Trump, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and now they're... And, and this is what's interesting, man. This is the most interesting part because I did not anticipate this. So I, so it was my birthday last year and I got a call from a famous filmmaker and he's like, happy birthday. I was like, thanks. And he's like, well, so who are you mentoring? How many people are you mentoring? He said to me. And I said, uh, what? And he goes, well, you know, I'm mentoring five people. How many are you mentoring? You've got all this knowledge. How many people? And I said, nobody. And I started feeling guilty because he was guilt tripping me. And so I started talking to this young guy, Ryder Lee, and I said, you want to make a film? And he said, yeah. And so I said, I'll finance it and you, you do the most of the work and I'll write it. And so in 88 days from the point of that conversation to the point that it got released on Amazon Prime, it was 88 days total. It was the fastest film I ever made. And um, uh, there were no films on board about JFK that I could find because I looked because it was a competition to me, right? Mm -hmm. In June of 2023, by September, two months after my film had come out, there were 17 JFK mm -hmm. projects going yeah. on Netflix, Amazon, um, uh, uh, Paramount, um, Hulu, uh, National Geographic, and every one of them what is carefully designed, if you watch it, to refute what's in JFKX, to find witnesses who say they said things that they never said before, for right. instance, like right. the guy that found the bullet on the on the back seat of the car. The Secret Service guy came out about three weeks after my film came out and said that he found the magic bullet on the back seat of the limousine and he put it on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital. Like, Wait a minute. That is like you are. That's obstruction of justice. That's 
That is outrageous that that guy isn't even arrested. I understand he's 86, but still, um, you know, that guy is admitting that in a major crime, he obstructed justice and, and uh, uh, that evidence had he, he contaminated the evidence mm -hmm. uh, for Absolutely. sure. And, and anyway, you're talking about the magic bullet that changed direction three times. That, that's the yeah, one. just to be clear. Yeah. Which now we know didn't even exist. That was on right. the on the car, and then of course the BS explanation. That, oh, it must have popped out of his back. Well, right. wait a minute. It ended up in Connolly. Yeah. How did it come back? <laughs> and the, and the, what I what I really enjoy most about JFKX is how I point out all the contradictions yeah. in this case. Yeah. So we have the Zabruder film, which shows a bullet hitting JFK here, but then we show the autopsy picture and there's no wound here at all. Yeah. It's like, huh? Yeah. Uh, you guys can't even keep your story straight. <laughs> and you know, and, 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 and how no one else has ever pointed this out. No JFK conspiracy theorists have ever pointed any of this out, which is really really odd okay and we're gonna get into all of this uh, step by step by step i realized yep. yesterday so first of all jay uh chapeau in france uh, i tip my hat to you i saw the documentary uh in late december i watched it again last night to prepare for this show and i'm yeah. like i was head blown i i knew it was going to be great you do great work but i'm like guys everybody should watch this documentary i'm telling you it's such a departure and there's so many intelligent, thoughtful, methodical questions that Jay brings up in this documentary that you have no choice to look at the previous evidence and say, oh, my God, we've been fucked with again. So having said that, I watched the show with Sarah. She had not seen any of the previous stuff on the JFK assassination files. And so it's Good. probable that people in our chat now are in that same position. So what yeah. I'd like you to do, maybe to begin with a little bit, is talk about the Warren Commission, but also how it was portrayed in uh, JFK, the Oliver Stone movie. That seems to be the baseline upon every, uh, upon which everybody has at least a foothold into this story. Start there, maybe spend four or five minutes there to explain what that main theory is from the Warren Commission. And then I'll play the uh, trailer for your JFKX uh, documentary. And we'll get into all of these things here step by step by step to bring the audience along with us in your uh, documentary and your thought process creating this film. Let's start here, Jay. Uh, yeah. So um, um, where do you want me to start? The JFKX, as it's portrayed by Oliver Stone, getting into the Warren Commission and the baseline okay, so, of what people think about the JFK right, assassination so, story. So there's two theories on J on the JFK assassination in the general public. One is the one propagated by the Warren Commission, which is a commission that was put together by LBJ, the, the guy who followed Kennedy as president. And then the second one is the conspiracy group. And these two are diametrically opposed to each other. They'd believe exactly the opposite. The government people think that Oswald used a high-powered weapon, uh, Carcano, a rifle from the sixth floor of the depository, uh, shot down through the window and got Kennedy twice, first on the first shot and missed and got him on the third shot again. And that is the magic bullet, supposedly, that spun around and hit Connolly. Mm -hmm. And then the conspiracy theorists say, no, no, no. The Zabruder film clearly shows that the guy was over the grassy knoll and that he shot Kennedy from the side and that there's a giant conspiracy and it's all covered up. And um, Oliver Stone got involved in it after he watched the great documentary series, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. Um, he got involved in this whole thing and made what I consider to be one of the best movies ever made, uh, JFK, uh, by Oliver Stone. Just, as, as a filmmaker, I'm, I'm talking about, it is one of the most incredible films ever made. That's all I can say. It's just, and, just and Costner, movie. it was one of Costner's uh, best roles also. He did a great job. Yeah, it was actually, yeah. uh, it, it was a great film, yeah. but you know, there are problems in the film and here's what happened with, with the whole pedigree here. <clears throat> About 10 years ago, I found Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone had the, the Bruder film enhanced for the film for JFK back in 91. Now, about 10 years ago, somebody put it up on the internet, the complete enhanced version. It was up on YouTube, and I saw it. It was only up for about six weeks, and it got taken down. Uh, I don't know why. You know, In those days, everything was so freeform, you could see it. And so I watched it like 50 times, and uh, I saw everything that I saw in JFKX. I saw then. 
And I was completely flabbergasted by what I saw. And then I went back and I watched JFK by Oliver Stone. And I noticed that he carefully edits around the most important parts of the Zabruder film uh, and leaves them out of his film. So my conclusion is that, first off, I'm a huge admirer of Oliver Stone. So, I mean, like, like top five filmmakers of all time for me. Right. Um, I, my conclusion is this, that he ordered, he, he, he went ahead, he wrote the screenplay. He finally got the money. That's how things work in Hollywood. And then he got the money to pay to get the Zabruder film enhanced which cost like $100,000, a lot of money in, in 1991. And um, he's in the middle of pre-production, probably lining up the shoot and everything when he finally gets the enhanced version and he turned it on and he saw exactly what I saw. But he realized that, hey, I'm into this for millions of dollars. I've already written the screenplay for this. I've right. hired Tommy Lee Jones and Ke Kevin Costner, and I can't, I can't, I can't go back. So I think Oliver Stone knows exactly what's in JFKX, and you know the silence is deafening. It mm -hmm. really is. The silence from Hollywood is deafening, and I'm waiting now for you know, some Hollywood technicians to come forth like they did after my moon landing expose right. and come out and say, you know, this guy's right. What he's saying is right. This is what's going on here. They and were too, uh, they were too far into production to reverse the course on that ship. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think, I think Oliver Stone has to know because he's a filmmaker yeah. and, and that's the thing about JFKX, which makes it different from every other JFK documentary ever made. And that is this, First off, the, the genius of the film is that Ryder and I, the filmmakers, asked ourselves the question, what would happen if the Zabruder film was run through that same software that they're using nowadays to enhance old movies so that, you, you know, it looks like it was shot in 4K and 24 right. frames a second. All right. the scratches are gone and, and everything. And that was the genius of the film is that we show you the Zabruder film as you've never seen it before. It's in 4K. It's uh, it's run in, in regular speed and you can see everything. It's like looking through a piece of glass and um and and everything that all the eyewitnesses say uh, we show a lot of the eyewitnesses what john Connolly says uh, we show it's just not in the film sorry um what you're saying is not there and um and then you know there's all sorts of uh, uh, mysterious non-actions being taken by people and and all sorts of things and, and again so many questions are raised that the conspiracy theory people never raise, never, right. ever raise. Right. I, I think you did an amazing job. Okay. So let's break it down. In my mind, when I looked at this and I said, okay, if we're going to do a good job uh, in the whodunit, typically you, you go around and you ask, well, who has motive, right? Who, who are the enemies of, of JFK? Well, here we have yeah. military industrial complex to some extent. Uh, yeah. He wasn't a very pro a warmonger, same as Trump, by the way. So he has that same enemy in common. Uh, we have we have the bankers uh, with respect to uh, the control of the central banks and perhaps this idea that he wanted to bring back uh, silver certificates or uh, bring a monetary policy back into the control of the United States. Uh, we mm -hmm. have the CIA, of course, which he was famous for being angry at, wanting to disperse to all corners of the wind here after the Bay of Pigs incident. And of course, we have the mob and all of this. So <laughs> pick one, anyone. A lot of people here um did not like him speak about maybe those four enemies how they tie in and eventually we'll get back into because i talked about the military industrial uh, complex how that maybe relates to space and perhaps how this is tying into the fight that we're going to see here in 2024 so let's talk about those enemies a little bit here to set the stage for the audience how serious they were and how in fact the war hits called on him all right so i gave a talk at uh, mufon a couple of years ago about this and I, I showed how JFK and Forrestal, the first Secretary of Defense, went to Germany at the end of World War II and went to all the places where the Germans were developing their craft. Um, mm. And that Forrestal came back and started MJ-12 um, to have a group of elites look at all this and try to make some sort of assertion. And Forrestal was JFK's like mentor.
Mm-hmm. And they would sit there, both Irish, both Catholic. Um, they would sit around uh, and, and talk. Uh, it was well known and it would be in quiet and, and, and in just the two of them. And um, I believe that, of course, I believe Forrestal got murdered, um, probably for saying too much. And then, and by the way, the last person to see Forrestal alive was LBJ, um, and um, which is very interesting. And um, and I and believe just to be clear, the story is that he jumped out of that. Uh, yeah, hospital. he jumped out of the thirteenth story window of the right. Bethesda Hospital, the same hospital that JFK had his supposed autopsy. Right. And um, uh, then I believe what happened is is that JFK became president. And then he almost immediately, within six months, made his famous speech about we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. And 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 NASA had already told him, Werner von Braun had already told him that we'd have to build a rocket the size of the Empire State Building to get to the moon, and we can't do that. There's no no way possible. So Kennedy knew that they didn't have the uh, um, ability to get to the moon and back, uh, but they did have other things that would help them get to the moon and back. And he knew all about that because Forrestal had told him about it. And so um, Kennedy was using the ruse of trying to get to the moon by regular rockets by the end of the decade, I believe, to force NASA's hand and make them release the technology. Disclose the technology, yeah. But they didn't. They hired Stanley Kubrick and faked it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I say they went to the moon. I'm just saying what they showed us isn't real. Right. And besides, it would be very hard to take photographs on the moon because it's filled with gamma rays and it's just, there's no way in the world. But anyway, so with this kind of knowledge, we come to understand who these enemies that Kennedy is making, who are they really? Who is the central bankers, the military industrial complex, the CIA? And the mob. Who are they? And do the Kennedys know and who's above them? <laughs> exactly. In right. other words, Kennedy was invest his brother, mostly Bobby, was investigating the frontline shock troops for the <clears throat> for the Elohim. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, they they came to realize it. Um, uh, as I said in my last show here, that, that the uh, most of the occult groups in, in Europe had known about all of this by the early 1900s and about the translations of the Bible and how they were wrong and what the Bible was really saying. And they began to look around at the world and try to understand what was going on with these translations. And uh, this all got to... Um, Forrestal and Kennedy and and everything and and it may be the whole purpose behind the secret space program. Uh, for all we know, we don't know. I mean, you know, right. we, we we got cut off. We don't know any more than what they're doing, except what we can see and uh, and hear from insiders and things if they're even telling the truth. And so, um, I believe that Kennedy had a head full of ideas. Uh, when he came into office that we have, we are totally unsuspecting of. And, right. and he came in and he tried to force something to occur. And by doing that, he saw the face of the enemy and he realized that the enemy was too strong to vanquish. It was right. too pervasive. He didn't realize that the CIA and the mob had married in the 50s, they, mm-hmm. the CIA couldn't do like assassinations on American soil because it was against their charter. So they hired the mob to do it. And right. so pretty soon the mob is like, oh, yeah, we're the hitmen for the CIA. And you can't touch us. You can't investigate can't us. Touch us. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why they were untouchable. <clears throat> and and um, uh, same thing that, with that's Army. kind of like SNC Lavalin here in Canada. They keep doing these deferred prosecutions because they were acting on behalf of the government to do re- regime changes across the world. But I digress. We shouldn't get into that too much here. Uh, so, folks, if you're just new to this and you're like, "What the hell is what, what, what's Jay talking about? Who are these Elohim?" Go watch this episode. This is part two of the Angels: The Great Deception Exposed. Jay and I recorded that on the 21st. It's based on. In part, some of the work by uh, Mauro Bellino, he wrote the book here, The Naked Bible. So you don't want to miss that episode. If you haven't seen it, it'll give you a lot more context here for this uh, particular decode here today. And on that note, too, I want to inform you that I will be uh, um, interviewing 
uh, Paul Wallace. Paul oh, Wallace yeah. is the author of the Eden a Conspiracy a series. He's talking about paleo contact again here. So in the same subject matter here. So this will be part three of the Angels and the Great Deception Exposed. That's going to be on January 9 at 7 p.m. Eastern. I can't wait to have. You don't uh, want to miss that one. <laughs> it's going to be a cool <laughs> one. Okay, uh, Jay, thank you for setting the stage here. We've talked about the enemies. Uh, let's. Why don't we do this? I want to play the trailer uh, now. So let me just uh, switch side decks here for a second here. Just make sure we have sound for the audience members. Uh, window this one here so we'll play the trailer of your jfk x and then i want to get into i don't want to spoil the beans for everybody here so this is what, why it is, it's difficult for me to do this decode here today because at the same time it's like it's so mind-blowing but at the same time i don't want to give too many spoilers i want people to go and see this uh, documentary so we'll play the trailer first and jay i'll have a couple of questions for you and then i'll leave it to you perhaps to <laughs> lead me as to how much you want to share about right. this amazing documentary you've put together so let me put this on the screen share the screen uh, there you go. Uh, there you go. Okay, so let me play this and let me know right away if you can't hear the sound here. This should work. Okay, play. The entire world was shocked when the President of the United States was assassinated in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Much of the world has wondered what really happened that day. Countless conspiracy theories have sprung up in an attempt to understand what really happened to President Kennedy. Was it the CIA, the mob, the lone assassin? Who exactly killed JFK? <laughs> JFKX, Solving the Crime of the Century, is an investigation into these events. The film answers the most basic questions about what really happened on that day. You will discover the truth behind one of the most traumatic events in world history. You will see the assassination of JFK with new eyes as the realization of the truth is revealed. JFKX, Solving the Crime of the Century, will unveil the truth behind the events of November 22nd, 1963, like no film has ever done before. All right, guys, there you go. That's a good snippet for you. Thank you so much, Ajay, for this trailer uh, and sharing it with me for the audience here today. It's really cool. Um, I want to start with something that's obvious that hit me right away. And I want to bring it in context. Let me just bring my volume back down here a little bit so I don't blow the speakers. Uh, with a couple of things that happened over the last number of years. So first of all, here in Canada, a couple of years ago, we had this uh, Corporal Cirillo uh, shooting up Parliament Hill. And uh, this made the whole story. And this was a justification for putting more money into our equivalent of our spy, spy agencies here in Canada. But during that event, oddly enough, let me just see if we can change um, the decks here. During that event, what was interesting was that all of the cameras, the traffic cameras in that particular area were down for maintenance exactly during this particular very critical time in Canadian history. So I was like, huh, okay, maybe that's just a coincidence, right? And then again, I'm like, oh, wait, that happened again here <laughs> when Epstein supposedly suicided himself. Oh, yeah, all the cameras in his cell and around his cell were all down for maintenance. Um, oh, that's interesting. And I also, the same thing happened, I guess, with Princess Diana in the tunnel. The cameras uh, weren't working. So I bring that up because in your documentary, one of the things that you kind of blow my mind with, first of all, is this guy's a rock star. Everywhere he lands at the airport, there's thousands of people. Everybody's there. But suddenly, at the grassy knoll, there's like nobody there. The no. mainstream media is not there. Explain that to your audience members and see how that is one of those coincidences that make you go, hmm, Jay. Yeah, so uh, Dallas, Texas had three uh, uh, network affiliate stations there at the time, uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Um, I used to work at a news uh, uh, station, local news station. I know exactly how they function. Um, they all had in those days a line of 16 millimeter Bolex cameras uh, with the three lenses on them. And they had a processing lab in the uh, news uh, building where you could immediately take your film and process it to get it on the nightly news. There was no video in those days. And um, uh, the rock star president is going to parade through the very center of your town at 1230 at lunchtime on a beautiful sunny day 
in November and not one network sent a cameraman down there to film the president and his beautiful wife in their open limousine. But we show in the film that there were cameramen there, um, but they weren't filming the president. They were filming the bystanders. They were filming people running up the grassy knoll. They were filming people diving on the ground. But just when the president was going by, they just didn't feel like turning their cameras over that direction, uh, which is an anomaly of the highest order, uh, actually. And, um, and so the only person in the whole world that actually filmed it was Abraham Zabruder, a tailor, who lived, uh, had an office, uh, you know, right nearby? He came by with his uh, regular eight movie camera, and um, and sat right in front of the grassy knoll on a podium, and got was really in the the perfect place to uh, film everything. And uh, he was, uh, of course, a thirty third degree Freemason, and um, Dallas is at thirty three degrees latitude and the freemasonic building is right there at the triple underpass where the whole event took place kennedy's regime was called camelot which is the prince uh which is king uh, arthur's uh regime uh clearly jackie was guinevere and this was a reenactment of the killing of the king uh freemasonic uh, uh ritual and um, done exactly in the right order and everything. And like all of the other uh, rituals of the killing of the king, it's it's fabricated. It's theatrical. It's not real. They don't really kill the king. Mm -hmm. It's just all a fabricated thing. Just like in the old days, they used to kill the pope. Um, and, but they didn't really kill the Pope. They would fabricate that they killed the Pope. Then the Pope would be reborn. It was this whole Catholic ritual that went on for a couple hundred years. And, um, and still, this is what I think is semi what the basis of some of this things that were going on on November 22nd, 1963 were happening. Also, we should understand that November 22nd is also when at the cusp of uh, Scorpio and Sagittarius. It's also the beginning in the lunar month of Ophiuchus. Uh, the 13th sign uh, starts on November 22nd. And uh, it looks like it, the astrology was all figured out ahead of time and everything for this event to succeed. And uh, it, that could be another whole film, by the way. <laughs> we could do a whole show with Julie on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, for yep. sure. Oh, she would um, love that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Okay, so we just talked about the media, and why I set that up is because, of course, we don't have mainstream high-quality cameras of the exact shooting. They may exist, but we don't have them yet to this day, right? And yeah. so, but we do have the Zabruder film, and now controversy is coming out with the Zabruder film. Now, as you said, we've had the first iteration years after the um, the assassination. It was very grainy, hard to tell. Then we had some people um, in handsome movies. Uh, part of that was used in the uh, Oliver Stone movie, and um, to some extent now with new technologies we're able to get in there and there's also another a bunch of um um researchers coming out who suggested that perhaps that that zapruder film had been faked somehow because there are so many anomalies and not yes. knowing why those anomalies were there or what they were specifically pointing to uh it they came to the conclusion that perhaps it had been faked now hold your horses on that for a second here so what i'm going to do here i'm going to go back down to um the actual uh, documentary here with Jay. And Jay, I want to play maybe a two-minute clip where you're talking about these splices in the Zabruder film. And this is critical here for a moment. So let me see if I can bring this up for the, for the audience. Share this one here. <clears throat> this one here. Okay, so we're going to play this uh, two-minute clip and get back to the conversation. Something has been altered, and they're trying to remove it. So there is a splice in the Zabruder film. There's two splices in the Zabruder film. Time Life magazine, which owned the Zabruder film, did not tell the Warren Commission when they gave them a copy of the Zabruder film that there were two splices in it. Now, this is evidence being used in the murder of the president of the United States, and this evidence has been altered. There's frames missing from the Zabruder film at splice 212. There's frames 208, 209, 210, and 211 are missing from the Zabruder film. And this is obstruction of justice. This is a, a interfering with evidence, interfering with an investigation. They have to tell 
the Warren Commission that there's two splices in that film. They have to tell the Warren Commission exactly how those two splices occurred and who is responsible for it. We do not know the name of the technician who caused the damage. And furthermore, it took them four years after the assassination for Time Life to admit there was any splices in the Zabruder film. I consider it an egregious crime that Time Life, first off, did the splice, and then secondly, didn't tell us about it. Okay, I'm going to stop here. There's another minute into this clip, but I just want to address that. We cannot underestimate here what you're saying. This is falsification or at least obstruction here of the evidence in the murder case of the a U.S. Uh, sitting president. Explain your reaction to that here uh, and share a little bit more details here as to the timeline and perhaps why, uh, in your view, um, Time Life Magazines was up to this particular uh, shenanigan, Jay. All right, so as soon as Zabruder shot the film, Time Life was like there. I mean, it was like within an hour. Time Life is offering him, I don't know what they offered him, a lot of money uh, for the film. And he hadn't processed it or anything. He just had it in his camera. And uh, so he agreed to do it. You know, it's, it's weird. The whole thing, the telling of the story is very weird. And it sounds like it's uh, contrived to me. Anyway, he does give it to them. They supposedly take it off, have it processed. And then um, uh, now they have it in their hands. And then a week later after the assassination, they show all the frames in the Time Life magazine. I mean, Life magazine. I have it over here somewhere. Uh, you know, all the frames are in, of the film are in there. Uh, they're real grainy and hard to see. And, and you can't really make out what's going on too well. And it even looks like they may have reversed a couple frames. And it, it, it's useless. But um, so... Uh, <clears throat> So then the Warren Commission gets put in and they request the Zabruder film and Time Life gives them the Zabruder film without telling anyone that there's there's a split, two splices, the most important splice at 212, because see, all the frames and films are counted. So you can tell if there's frames missing because mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all counted. There's little numbers on the side that you can see if you know what you're looking for. And um, uh and it just happens to be, I'm probably going to say this in, on, when you play the clip, but it just happens to be right when the limousine goes behind the freeway sign. Right. So the, the limousine passes behind the Stemmons freeway sign for maybe a third of a second, something really fast motion. And then that's when the action starts. So everything that I talk about in JFKX actually doesn't start until that splice. The splice okay. two. Thank you for that. Let me play that next one minute. We'll set that up and we'll come back to our conversation here. All right, here we go and play. I didn't tell the Warren Commission about it. And the Warren Commission used the Zabruder film as their timeline, their clock. So even your clock is screwed up. It's missing by a quarter of a second, at least. Time Life has to tell the Warren Commission that the Zabruder film has been altered. However, this splice at 212, at frame 212, is a very convenient splice. It occurs exactly when JFK's limousine goes behind the Simmons freeway sign. So researcher Fred Newcomb, who is a JFK researcher, he did an examination of the Zabruder film, and he was fascinated by the splice as I was. And he did a color balance reading on the film. He noticed there was definitely a color balance change in the film after the splice. He noticed that that color balance was a bluer hue than the redder hue before the splice. What that tells me is that the Bruder was using daylight Kodachrome film. They made Kodak made two kinds of film for Kodachrome. They made daylight Kodachrome and they made indoor Kodachrome. The daylight Kodachrome is more balanced towards the red. The indoor Kodachrome is more balanced towards the blue. Fred Newcomb, finding that the color balance has shifted to blue after the splice tells me that all the film after the splice has been run through some kind of optical printer because the light that's used in an optical printer is an indoor light. Therefore, you'd want to use indoor Kodachrome for your copy. Okay. <laughs> Most researchers who are not into movie making would not know this necessarily, and it would not come up in some of this research. This is fascinating uh, to say the least here. Can I go further a little bit here? Yes, let me play another 50 seconds on this clip and we'll come back to this today. <clears throat> All it calls is space to shine upon 
So the Kennedys fly from D.C. to Fort Worth for a, a meeting. When they landed in Fort Worth at the airport at Fort Worth, there were literally thousands of people. It was like the Beatles first landing in New York City. It was that crazy. There were, people were screaming and cheering and uh, must have made you know the Kennedys actually very happy because it was an incredibly jubilant crowd. And then later they took a short flight from Fort Worth to Dallas and at the airport of Dallas again. There's thousands of people screaming and cheering and everybody's really happy. The Kennedys are really happy. And then they take their limousine uh, to go ostensibly to Dealey Plaza to the parade. And we can see there's no more than maybe 100 to 200 people. It's lunchtime, sunny day in Dallas, downtown Dallas. There's literally thousands of people working in the office buildings. And yet they can only muster up a couple of hundred maybe people to uh, watch the rock star president and his wife. And then after the splice at 2.12, we hardly see anyone in Dealey Plaza watching the president. Maybe eight people or nine people behind him in that little park behind the limo, but that's all we see. It's not only the crowd that did a vanishing act here in Dealey Plaza, but Dallas had three network affiliates. They had NBC. Okay, we talked about the media here. Now, what's interesting about um, less people at the critical event also suggests here, uh, what you're getting at here too, is that there perhaps modification to the frame itself after the limousine goes through that highway sign. Explain yeah. that to the audience members, what you see there. And people can go watch the documentary and see all the details here. I don't want to give too much away here, but that's critical here in our view and our understanding yeah. of what just happened. Go ahead. In, in fact, when I show the film to groups of people, uh, and I, I show that one thing that you're talking about, there's an audible gasp yeah. in, in the audience. So they're like, they see it immediately. So after the splice, we have evidence, seriously good evidence, that there's been tampering on an optical printer. And what we see is that also Abraham Zabruder suddenly can't operate a camera anymore. Um, where he's got everybody in perfect middle of the frame through the entire shot, all of a sudden at the critical moment, he starts apparently looking like he's panning up and dropping the limousine down to the bottom of the frame so you can only see a little portion of what's going on. And I contend that that's the optical printing, that they moved, that they, they used a traveling mat and they separated the limousine and the occupants from the background. They shrunk the limousine down so they could move it and they moved it down to the lower part of the frame so you could not see what was actually going on and the way that you know that this is true is because the people in the background there that you're showing are as big or bigger than the people in the car that cannot be see right there yeah, those right people there. are Th th that cannot be. And anyone who knows optics knows that uh, the further the, an object is away from the lens, the smaller it is. It doesn't matter what lens it is. The optics always follow that law. Yet here we have a woman who is a big, her head is as big as the people in the car, maybe even bigger. Mm -hmm. And that is... Um, that is what they did. They used an optical printer to hide the critical moment and um, uh, and time life has to be involved in this and um, everybody has to be involved. There can be no doubt about it. Um, the thing about uh, moving the limousine down from the frame of view, also obfuscating perhaps what people are doing at the bottom of the car. We'll get into that in a moment here. So <clears throat> as a movie maker, um, talk about the difference between physical effects and digital effects. This is a very important part here, moving into setting up here, this technology that perhaps was used here in your uh, opinion uh, yep. with this documentary. So explain the two differences between these uh, movie effects, Jay. All right, so in movies, there's two kinds of effects. There's physical and digital. 
Now, digital, of course, only came around when computers and videotape were invented in uh, 70s, really the late 70s during Star Wars and those kinds of movies. So um, before then, everything was physical effects. And I love physical effects. I'm, I'm actually a kind of an expert on physical effects. And I had to learn because I was making my own movies. So I had to learn how to make, um, you know, somebody's head look like it exploded or a car flipping over. And you know, there's all these tricks that you learn in the filmmaking. And um, like Christopher Nolan, the filmmaker, he loves physical effects. And that's why I like his films, because he eschews digital and I can't stand digital. Um, and it just is, I guess, because I'm an old filmmaker and I just don't, it doesn't look right to me. Digital looks right. phony, but right. physical doesn't look phony. And I love physical. So in a movie, when a guy falls off a building or a car flips over or whatever, that's a physical effect. The car really is flipping over. The guy really is falling off of a building. There's, you know, cushions and boxes and stuff to absorb the hit and everything. But you know, those are physical effects. And um, digital effects are now taking over from physical effects because they're safer, cheaper, um, all the rest. The physical effects are not um, safe. Mm -hmm. They're very dangerous. Um, very dangerous. I've seen many, many people get really, really hurt doing physical effects. And, um, and so uh, uh, it's really important to understand that, um, that the, there's a physical effect called um, that they use very rarely until the 1970s in Hollywood, uh, and it's called a squib. And a squib is a uh, how they fake a gunshot wound in Hollywood. Now, when I was young, I'd go see like Gregory Peck westerns and stuff, and he would get shot, and there'd be a, a quarter size blood spot on his you know, his stomach, and we would all in the theater, oh, that's so fake. That's not what it would look like, right? And, uh, I, and I remember all my friends saying that because we were all hunters and right. we, knew, we knew exactly what, <laughs> what a gunshot looks like. And um, uh, uh, and so when my generation started making movies in the 70s, we said, no way. It was like a collective, no way. We're never going to show BS gunshots. We're going to try to show as realistic a gunshot as possible. And so finally, the use of squibs got to be used a lot more starting in the late 70s, 80s. And Quentin Tarantino, of course, is the absolute master of the squib. He loves them. Hey, Quentin, go watch my film and then tell everybody what you see. I really mean that. And um, so uh, so squib is a, a device that um, it has a, 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 a like a thin metal plate on the bottom. And then it has a small pile of gunpowder over the top. And then um, fake blood is placed over the top of that. And then if you're really good at it, you put like styrofoam chunks in there and stuff to make it look like bullet brain matter and stuff. Then the whole right. thing's wrapped up in a prophylactic. And then they put a sticky substance underneath it so they can stick it on the actor. Right. So the actor gets gets the um, squib. He has it put on their chest, let's say. Then there's a string that goes under the shirt, down the pants. There's a technician below who pulls the string, which ignites the squib. And so the director goes three, two, one. And and the actor, you know, does their reaction. So it look, and the thing explodes and it's very effective in, in movies and it looks really good. You add in sound later and, um, and and it looks like you just watched somebody get hit with a gunshot, sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it doesn't really look like that. Gunshots are not. When, when a bullet hits something, it it doesn't explode where it hits. It, it might explode on the other side when coming out of something. Right. But yeah. when a bullet hit, if a bullet hit me here, I'm not. There's not going to be this big explosion. Right. Uh, no. If you're a hunter, you'll know that uh, yeah. the exit wound is often way bigger than <laughs> the entry yeah. wound. Uh, exactly. That gets into the question of blood. Also, supposedly in the Warren Commission here, he shot twice: once in the neck first, <clears throat> they missed the second shot, and then in the head. But even that neck wound, if that were to be true, just looking at the video. There's no blood in the video, and it should be spewing like crazy if that were real a real a gunshot wound. This is a high cal caliber rifle shooting through very soft tissue. Uh, the damage would already be extensive there just with the oh, neck wound. So <clears throat> it would be, it would be, he would have been bled out within 30 seconds if he'd been shot in the neck. Any yeah. hunter will tell you that. 
Uh, so I think I think we can leave that one alone. It's so obvious to me that uh, the next theory uh, explosion doesn't really work. So l- let's put that aside and we can let other people debate that one. It's been done at nauseum. But I want to get into um, the actual clip here and look at the clues as to why perhaps there's certain movements that JFK is doing here could suggest that he is setting up for the shot here uh, for this squib technology. But before we get into that too, there's a critical point here also Suddenly, as we start getting into these frames here, uh, the Secret Service are called back from around the limousine. Explain yep. that first, and then we'll get into the squib uh, technology. Jay. Yeah, the, so the Secret Service, they're, they're, they're trained to run uh, on the side of the, of the slow-going limbo so they can get hit, basically, by any shrapnel or bullets or whatever to protect the president. That's what they're hired to do. And um, you can see, we show a clip in the movie, one of the Secret Service guys is running up to the limousine to go do his job, and he's clearly called back by a superior. Hey, get away from there. Come back. And he's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. We're not going to cover the president with all yeah. these open windows and everything? And mm-hmm. um, and I believe that was done to uh, limit the amount of witnesses. Okay. Um, I also believe that's why there's very few people in Dealey Plaza after the splice because, again, it's to limit the, the amount of witnesses and keep everything as tightly controlled as possible. We all know that uh, a Secret Service went and collected all the cameras, mm-hmm. all of the photographs, everything is immediately after the uh, so-called assassination. Now, all the witnesses said, no, I gave my camera to this guy who claimed he was in the secret service and, he, and they all got confiscated and they were never seen again. Mm-hmm. And just to be clear, they're doing that today too. I was watching their video the other day of King Jong Un and all the secret service are running next to the, to the limousine. This is still standard practice even today yeah. in 2024. Okay, let's go back to, uh, let me see if I can bring this up for the audience here. We'll play this clip here. I'm not sure I'm exactly at the right spot here, but we see that first scene here where he seems to be grabbing something in the Warren Commission, he said he's holding at his neck. But if that were the case here, we'd already see big blood spatter, which we don't. But again, we'll move past here. And explain this here. Uh, I'll keep going here, but explain what you think is the sequence of events here um, and why it's being obfuscated at the bottom of the screen. Let's roll through this and then we'll roll back again. Okay. Okay, that's the film, the high quality film. You notice there's no brain matter or anything on the back trunk. Or anything. Let's go back and start that again, then. I'm gonna show you. I'll yeah. And now. so far, uh, except for that little puff of smoke around his head, there's no blood in, on anybody else on the seat in front on on uh, his wife either. So let me just scroll back here. And go that. It's a little bit harder to do on this screen here. We'll see. I get you. Point. Okay, hold on. Come on. You can do it. There you go. All right. So he comes behind the freeway sign and he's supposedly grabbing the neck wound with no blood, but he's not really grabbing the neck at all. What he's really doing is he's reaching into his jacket and he's pulling something out and he's placing it right here on the right side of his face. And you can clearly see it in the shot. And it's right casting here. a shadow in the noonday sun. There it is. It's right there on the side of his face. Jim mm-hmm. Fetzer, who studied the Zabruder film extensively, he calls that the blob. And he believes that it was done post um, uh, 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 in the studio later with, with a paint or something. He can't understand what he's looking at. So he writes uh, in his book, The Zabruder Film Hoax, that the blob is evidence that this film has been tampered with. But he d- never questions why there is no blood on the neck wound and why Kennedy actually is not really gripping his neck. If you actually look at the shot where he's supposedly gripping his neck, his hands are actually here. They're not up here. And and, and, and the right Do you think to notice, too, if he's shot in the neck, his white collar is still white. His yeah. cufflinks and uh, cuffs there are still absolutely white. She has no blood on her. Uh, up so, uh, <laughs> like, this it would be hitting, sense. honestly, just oh, yeah. I don't want to gross anybody out. Yeah. It would be hitting the back seat of the car right. uh, in front of them. It would right. be shooting out. Uh, I mean, it, it, it would be so grotesque that you would, really wouldn't even be able to look at it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's and no blood at all. And when they took a picture of the back seat of the car at Parkland Hospital, um, there was probably a tablespoon of blood right. uh, on the back seat, something like that. It didn't even look real, to be honest with you. Yeah. No, a head wound and a neck wound at that point would be yeah. devastating. Okay. So um, 
how far further else do I go with this? So essentially here, spell it out to people. Yeah. What do you think just happened here? So there, there seems to be a coordination also with his wife. She seems to be in on the move. Uh, why is she um, hopping on the back of the limousine also in the mainstream news? They were saying that she was trying to get a piece of his head that had flown out. That's that's the main story. But how do you associate that now with the script technology? What is she doing? What's her role in all of this? All right. So first I want to point out that when the car comes behind the freeway sign, every single occupant in that car, the driver, the Secret Service agent to his right, John Connolly and John Connolly's wife are all looking at JFK. All of them. You can see it in the film. All four people. Not ja Jackie, though. Jackie is nonchalantly looking off to her left uh, as if nothing happened. Don't forget, high-powered rifle shots are ringing out here. 30 caliber rifle shots. I don't know if you know how loud those are, but they're really loud. And in a cavernous downtown area, it's going to be even louder. But nobody in the car is reacting to rifle shots. They're all looking at JFK. And uh, as soon as uh, – so so I'm just going to say it. So JFK, for reasons that we talk about in the uh, uh, movie, um, he – places something right here on his face and you can clearly see it and oliver stone cuts those frames out of his movie by the way so you do, you do not see it in his movie it's clearly cut out of the movie so for two full seconds after he comes from behind the freeway sign we can see something weird on the side of his face then suddenly Everybody's looking at him in the limousine. Jackie decides to get involved. She comes around to the front and looks at Jack uh, from the front. Oh, there we conveniently go down to where nobody can see anything. And um, uh, we can't see what she does. And then the head explodes. Jackie gets out of the car and runs over and picks something up. Uh, we could be that the Secret Service agent also was going after that same thing and then runs back into the car, exactly the opposite of what any sane person would do if your husband had just been hit by a high-powered weapon one foot away from you. You would be on the floor of the car cowering. Um, anybody would. It's not no disrespect to Jackie Kennedy. Anybody would be doing the same thing. But Jackie does the opposite. She goes out and exposes herself even more to the would-be shooters, uh, intentionally grabbing something off the hood, which in our enhanced version, you can actually see. Um, so, um, so what is it? What's the mystery? What's going on here? Well, I mean, I really want you to go see my film. Um, and it's on Amazon Prime. It's only a buck ninety-eight, and um, international people can see it on Vimeo. But my contention is, is that for various reasons, John F. Kennedy faked his death, and the Zabruder film, the enhanced Zabruder film, shows that, and he did it for whatever reason. Now Jackie's coming around. She oh, I do. We do cut away. Okay, uh, and and uh, you and what Jackie is doing is she's coming around and she's reaching up and she's pulling the string on the squib, which is what is right here on the side of his face. And they had to optically lower the car to the bottom of the frame to hide Jackie's hands and what she's doing. That's pretty much it. And um, uh, there we go. Now we're mysteriously lowered in the frames. And then Jackie comes around and, and gets involved in the whole operation. Jack, of course, uh, once you see the explosion, again, when a bullet hits your head, it doesn't explode. But that I'm not going to argue any more about that. But um, are we going to see it here? Okay. Now that is... Now we see something silvery rolling up the side of up right above his ear, rolling up the side of the face. That's the silver, uh, the metal plate that is at the bottom of the squib. It rolled off his head, and she's going to retrieve it. 
That's what she's doing. She's retrieving the metal plate that rolled off his head because the squib gets really hot when from the explosion causes the metal to to bend and, and shape. It happens all the time in movies. And um, that's why you'll see the explosion and they'll cut away because they don't want you to see what happens after the, the bullet goes off because it'll be a dead giveaway. And um, so um, what we're seeing here is a Hollywood effect. Um, and, I, you know, we, we speculate as to what's going on here and why. And um, uh, I think that JFK had to get away from his enemies because he had just stoked too many fires and he did not know who he was dealing with until it was too late. And then he was, and let's not forget, we show it in the movie that um, FBI informant recorded a mobster saying that they were going to hit JFK. There'd been a hit on JFK ordered by the mob. And this was in October, a month before the JFK assassination. For sure, the FBI told JFK that there was a mob hit out on him. So he right. knew it. He knew there was a hit out on him. Um, he had to. They would have been derelict of duty not to have informed him. So we and we played the, the tape recording in the in the movie of, of the hit of the of the FBI recording of the guy saying they're we're gonna hit him from an office building. Um, it, it would be complete negligence to to <coughs> not take extra precautions when you already have a death threats uh, on the books, so to speak. Exactly, but they didn't take any precautions. Let me bring this up, and I don't want to go in here too. Like you're already giving a lot away here, uh, Jay. I do again, guys. I recommend you guys go check this out. So first of all, if you go to JFKX.org, this is the website where you can get both links here, as Jay uh, was talking about. So the U.S. Uh, international market here. If you click on this link, it will bring you to the Amazon Prime link. And if you're outside of the U.S., as I was here, I went through the Vimeo uh, link. So both of those links here for the U.S. and international are available on this page, and they're also here in the description box. Uh, below this video now um it doesn't end there <laughs> so what's that guy ron popiel uh, the, the commercial guy is like but there's more <laughs> so, there's a lot more guys to this documentary and i'm just gonna hint that in here now we're not gonna get into the details but there's a dead ringer uh, for jfk who also is killed on this day and yep. who perhaps has a big role to play here in the discrepancies and why some of the autopsy and some of the doctors are saying there's something wrong here between the Warren Commission and what we're seeing here on the table. I'll let you guys go watch uh, the uh, documentary to get into those details, but they're fascinating. Just that piece alone, again, brings up exactly. so many, so many questions. And on top of that, too, there is the question here also of another lover of JFK who just soon after his death also dies in a very mysterious way, again, without any fanfare, again, without any evidence as to who the killer might be, raising a lot of questions as to maybe those people had planned to exit the stage together. Again, go see the documentary. There's a lot there. Um, there is a lot there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, there's more, guys. This, this is so worth the price of entry for this documentary, guys. I can't recommend it enough. But here's where I want to go. We're already an hour into it. We've done, I hope we've done a good job with the audience members showing them, wow, this crazy gets crazier and crazier, and crazier the story does. Uh, but I want to bring it back to, one, even after this fact, if you go look at some of these enemies, nobody's copped to this yet. And the mob also has not copped to this yet. And a lot of those mobsters are like, well, I think Jimmy did it and I think Bobby there did it, but they still don't know who did it, right? So there's a, you would think after all of this time that we would have had an, incl an inclination as to who done it, but also we would have think that our judicial system, having all of the pressure of the American people, people around the world asking for um, questions, serious questions to be answered, you would think that they would go through that process. Your contention, Jay, is that they're not going there because that's not the real story. That's not what happened. And that's they right. cannot go through that process of answering some of those questions. It right. would betray the whole reason for this particular event on that day. So now, having said that, guys, go look at the autopsy stuff. This tippet guy, go look at this lover uh, story. But now let's go a little bit further. And we're going to come back to the beginning of the show. When we talked about all these enemies, I said to Jay, we have all these enemies lined up, but who are above them? 
Now, at this point, Jay, maybe this is more opinion. Maybe this is just conjecture. Maybe it's conspiracy theory. How does that tie in to what we're seeing now? As you discussed, we just have this new series now, uh, The um, Angels and the Great Deception Exposed. We're looking at a big way here, the Elohim and how they affected our world. Speak about why perhaps this event happened the way it did and how this is setting up or that event set up what we're seeing now here, the fight with the White Hats, the Alliance, the Trump uh, administration, all of these generals that were fired under the previous administrations coming together in this MAGA hat uh, scenario and how that ties into, yes, I'm going to go there, the Space Force. Jay. Ooh, that's a big one. Um, yeah, so uh, first off, you, sh you should know that uh, JFK Jr. and Donald Trump are actually were good friends before JFK Jr., left this world if that's what he did. And um, uh, so um, that's one thing you should know. Um, but the other thing is that's important is that Bobby Kennedy, his attorney general, his brother, he went after the mob and he began finding out, and we say it in the movie, we actually quote him, show him saying it, that he's found evidence that the mob is inside the government. 1962, he said, yeah. right? And I believe that Kennedy was put in office by a group of very wealthy people who wanted him to find out the truth about what's really going on in the world. And um, he put Bobby in because he trusted him as his brother. And Bobby went out and um, and was the bulldog looking into all of this stuff. And um, and uh, with the, uh, his knowledge of the space program, uh, the secret space program, uh, and what they were really doing, and we don't know what they were really doing. Um, he does, he did, but we don't. Um, I believe that they got in contact with. Um, uh, I don't know if they're ETs or what they are, but these forces that have been governing the earth for a long, long time. And I actually believe that Trump got in office with the same intention mm -hmm. to find out what was really going on. And, um, and that's why he'll never be allowed back, I believe. And, um, well, they're so, doing their darn best to not have him back with all these shenanigans yeah, in Colorado and yeah, Maine and the ticket. We're moving yeah. into a different era, and they're not able to keep things uh, contained anymore. And um, and they're, they're finding that very, very frustrating. Uh, what they're doing anyway is incredible, cred incredibly insane because the um, <clears throat> Supreme Court ruled years ago <clears throat> that a president can't be held for anything that happens while he's in office. So... Mm -hmm. So the, that's going to end up being the ruling. So, so why are we wasting our time with any of this? You know how many illegal things a president does every day? I mean, the order assassinations, they do all sorts of things that are illegal. If you start holding the president up for what uh, he agrees to do while he's in office, every president would be, uh, would be capital punishment. We get right. capital punishment. So, you know, the whole thing is ridiculous. So I believe that, that, um, that, uh, the other thing that's important in all of this is to remember that Kennedy was also in ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence. That's what the PT boats were in World mm -hmm. War II. They were intelligence boats. Mm -hmm. They were going, giving in and out, using their skiffs to get in and out, to look at places and take pictures and, and all the rest. They didn't, didn't fight. They were uh, intelligence gathering boats. And uh, Kennedy was in ONI. And so was... Um, so it was Forrestal. He was the head of the Secretary of Navy before he became Secretary of Defense. The Navy... He was part of Naval Intelligence, too. Yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. The Navy is the group that's really involved in all of this stuff. The, <coughs> the Navy ran NASA until Space Force took over. Um, the Navy is the elite part of the military. It's considered the most elite part. The elites themselves, if they're going to send their children into the military, tend to send them into the Navy. Um, <coughs> Kennedy didn't have to go to the Navy. He was a rich kid. He could have gotten out of it, but he didn't. He served in World War II and got wounded badly and probably ended up costing him his life because he got Addison's disease from his service there. And that uh, probably crippled him and probably ended his life early anyway. 
And um, so Kennedy um, went up against a bunch of forces that he thought were disparate forces. He thought the mob was different than the CIA and the CIA was different than the central bankers and, and all this. And, he, and but he didn't realize that actually um, after world war two, they all joined Merged together. together. Yeah. It was a yeah. giant merge. And I think that's what Bobby discovered. Bobby discovered that. Holy crap. You know, the mob and the CIA and the bankers and they're all together in one big thing. And then at that point, it was like, holy, we cannot fight against this. This is too big for two brothers to, to fight against. And well, not at that time. And so that sets up to perhaps this up where we're at today. So let me bring that up. Um, just the other day, let's see if I can bring this one up for the audience, a different slide deck here. Uh, U.S. Space Command reaches full operational capability. This leads yeah. into what you were saying here, how 2024 might be a game changer. This was uh, published on December 18th. Uh, on Zero Hedge, and I said, oh, yeah, ready to fight the Elohim or into a new battleground, if you want to put it that way. And what was interesting here, Shadow of Ezra said, hey, Donald Trump created the Space Force, and it has zero ties to all previous administrations. That's important in the context where Jay is saying that the mob had already infiltrated our government system, that uh, the Kazarian Mafia, the Zionists, whatever you want to call it, had infiltrated the judicial system, having suddenly a Space Force a fully funded space force, not attached to any of these older associations that, that might be, and for all intents and purposes, we can argue, are all beholden here to this Kazarian mafia, or at least the Stooges uh, from this Elohim um, worship cult, if you want to call it that, then yep. suddenly this makes a lot of sense. Tie that into perhaps where this goes now in 2024, the research of Biglino, but how we're hearing also some whistleblowers here at the military level also suggesting now are changing slightly their narrative to suggest that not only are we already in contention with space aliens, but that we might be in a big way, in a physical way, and very visible way for the rest of the human population here very soon. Jay. Yeah, that could be happening. I've heard from some of my intelligence sources that they are going to uh, release the alien news here soon. They haven't yet, so I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I don't even know if there are aliens. That could be another uh, BS story, for all we know. It could be just people that lived here on Earth somewhere that we don't know about who are very yeah, advanced. Continent. Yeah. Yeah, who are just very advanced. I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. I know this, that um, uh, somebody, some intelligence group that appears to be somewhat humanoid has been messing with the human race for a long, long time. I did a whole lecture at the UFO conference in Vegas in 2019 on it. Um, I called them the others. At the time, I didn't know what they were. Um, I, 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 I talked all about Jacques Vallée's work and uh, mm -hmm. uh, messengers of, of deception about how uh, he keeps finding evidence of these guys going way, way back. Um, they they uh, have been using the human race for a whole bunch of reasons, for yeah. farming, sex, uh, who knows, genetic experiments, uh, all sorts of stuff. And um, this all this information started coming out in the early 1900s. Uh, people were heading out to different parts of the earth and talking to different people for the first time and bringing back knowledge. A lot of it was German. A lot of it was mostly Germans. Actually, it was Germans mostly that were going out to Tibet and to Russia and, and the Russians also were doing it. And they brought back all of this knowledge and they, you know, they had to have figured it out. They had to, they had to have said, Oh my God, there's, there's a force bigger than us. That's ruling everything. And, and 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 basically, there's nothing that we can do about it. Um, and uh, I think that's the same conclusion that the Kennedys reached, uh, uh, that there was nothing that they personally could do about it. They set in motion several things that were really good that later are going to end up maybe helping us. But yeah, I think that we are talking about, okay, I'm going to get into this. There is a war. There has been a war between um, uh, Majestic 12 and a group within the Office of Naval Intelligence that is ostensibly called COM 12. And COM 12 is 12 top dudes that are from the Navy who are 
literally fighting against the majestic 12 people. I have no idea what they're fighting about. What, what, I have no idea. I can guess. I can make some conjectures, but it would just be that. And um, uh, and if you look, you'll see the remnants of this entire war. Now, when what's his name? The guy that hacked the Pentagon. I'm going to forget his name. The hacker that hacked the Pentagon in the early 2000s. He's from Scotland. Um, he oh, the guy with the red hair. They want an extradition for him there. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and he saw he saw the uh, sheet of uh, extra um, officers, yeah. uh, officers. That one, yeah. McKinnon. McKinnon. Yeah, Gary McKinnon. Yeah. He said that the, all the ships that were in the uh, secret space force were named after famous admirals. Remember, mm -hmm. all of them. So that that right away, so oh, this is all a navy operation, right? That's what this is, and I've got it, and. And I've I'd already done enough investigation into understanding the origins of NASA and its Navy or, or, or origins. And so what I'm saying is the Navy always thought they were always the top intelligence agency for the United States, all the way up until 1947 when they created the CIA. And the CIA superseded the ONI as the top intelligence agency, and the ONI never got over it never got over this. And they started immediately a war against the CIA. And it's been going on ever since the CIA was created. Kennedy was Navy. He was put in. Carter was ONI. He put in Admiral Stansfield Turner to run the CIA, causing the CIA to lose their cookies. They couldn't believe that there was an admiral running the place, right? Immediately he fires on Halloween night, I think 1978, he fires several hundred people in the CIA, uh, including all of George Bush's friends and associates who were <clears throat> associated with some certain things. And um, and then that, but that didn't cl clear the problem up. It actually made it worse because what happened is, uh, we now know this from Oliver North and the Iran Contra that these 200 or 300 fired CIA agents created another agency, a, a, a secret yeah. uh, agency that and went around went about the earth with nobody watching them now, uh, with uh, funding themselves with drug money and narcotics. Yeah, exactly. narcotics. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, and so we can't. We have to. We, so the Office of Naval Intelligence is. Um, the white hats. I don't know how white hat they are. I've talked to some of them. They seem like they're pretty cool guys. They're definitely no more than me. That's for sure. And um, they are at war with the representatives of the Elohim, you might say. I, I don't know what else is. I can get <laughs> further, but I mean, and again, all this sounds so crazy, but remember, that we're moving into an era now where all of this is all going to be known. It's pretty mm -hmm. soon. And I mean, all of it, it's just all going to be known. And we're, we're all just going to go, eh, yeah, so what? And, and, and right now we're just in that beginning stage where we're in shock mm -hmm. from seeing what we're seeing. And JFK X is part of that shock. And I'm making two or three more films in the next year and a half that are just going to be mm -hmm. one shock after another. And, if you watch them all at the same time, you'll probably ha end up having a heart attack or something. But um, uh, uh, so, yeah, that's what's going on here. And and it's all entwined. We mm -hmm. have the one president who, you know, there's another thing that people don't know about. J serious JFK researchers know this, but hardly anybody else does. And that is, I'm going to be very careful what I say here. Joe Kennedy, JFK's dad, was in the mob. He ran alcohol from Canada during the prohibition. Okay. He, he came, to, he was a, a secretary, I believe he was the secretary of state under Roosevelt. And he went to Hollywood and told, called all the producers in Hollywood together and told them not to make any anti-German propaganda films. And I just bring that up for another reason. It was also well known that um, Joe Kennedy was very, very aware of the Khazarian Mafia. Very, 
very aware and told both uh, all of his sons to be wary of them because they cannot be trusted. Now, hang on. Here's where it gets really good. Donald Trump, when he got out of uh, business school, he went to his dad, who was a famous construction builder in Queens and Brooklyn, and he pointed across the river and he said to his dad, I'm going over there, meaning Manhattan. I'm going over there to make my fortune. I'm not going to be building stuff in Queens. I'm building stuff there. And his dad said, son, you better be real careful messing with those people because those people will kill you. And mm -hmm. this is a true story. I've heard a hundred times from people who know Trump. And Trump said, no, I'm going to do it. And Trump went right into the, the nest there and, um, uh, and you know, got – got messed up with them and who knows what, what, what he discovered. Right. I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. So both the Kennedys and Trump have two, a bunch of stuff in common. One, neither one of them started a war when they were president. Um, two, they both were interested in the space program heavily. Um, three, they both um, were cool on Israel. They weren't the hot presidents all the other presidents were. Kennedy didn't want Israel to have any nuclear missiles. He was, you know, we we're not going to give them to him. And, and Trump, although he seemed on the surface to be rah, 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 actually, and I'm sure this is one of the reasons he's no longer in office, he refused to do a whole lot of things that the KM wanted him to do. Yeah, I think for the public, he was like just paying lip service, but that's the and extent. Paying lip service. And right. they, so they, they they would say, oh, bomb Iran, bomb Iran. And then he would go all the way up to the edge where he's going to bomb Iran. Ah, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And he, over and over, he did this. And I'm sure that after a while, he picked up the pattern and realized that he was not cooperating anymore right. with what they wanted. And then he had to go and they put in a guy who would cooperate. So um, they, there are these things, these weird things that they do have in common. So when I hear these crazy conspiracy theories, I say, oh, well, JFK is still alive and he's going to come back. And I don't believe any of that. But um, I do believe that there is a very serious connection between the Trump and the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. and, and I bet you RFK Jr. Um, is part of this in some mm -hmm. way. Well, I think you're right, and I think there's maybe more to be uncovered, and it's coming very soon. You could feel that it's bubbling to the surface now. I wanted to share just a quick personal anecdote to all of this, too, and it ties into World War II, the, um, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and how everything was structured uh, after World War II. Uh, my, my grandfather served um, in the European theater of war during World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, when he came back, um, he started working for the RCMP, the Royal Canadian uh, Mounted Police. And for all our lives, uh, we understood that he was basically a mailman in the RCMP. And uh, only after he died did we find out uh, quite a few medals and certificates of awards and badges that had something to do with way more than just carrying the mail. So there was a remnants there too of what he had done during World War II that had been brought under here at the RCMP uh, in Canada at the time. And I wish I could have talked to him about this. Of course, we, all, we found this, all of this out after he died. But when I started my YouTube channel and I got deleted the first time through some of the censorship, um, I had a dream about him, a very visceral dream about him. And he says, you know, Jean-Claude, you're fighting the same people I was fighting in World War II. And so it kind of brought me all back into, oh, okay, we all have a role to play here in um, extricating ourselves perhaps from this control of uh, the Elohim. And this is why the JFK X uh, documentary uh, that you've so beautifully put together uh, is important to watch here because it's a pivotal moment in our human history where perhaps the fight that was above ground that the Kennedys uh, were trying to attempt here suddenly went uh, covert. And now, if you look at some of the web data reports uh, from Clough High, uh, some of the predictions in there in the um, predictive linguistics are suggesting that the SOC, the self-organizing collective, or what you just call now the White Hats, we're getting to a point where those are going to become overt again and start to harmonize with the forces of the people here who are the truther community the conspiracy theories the people who uh, like carrie says in her book have that rebel gene 
<laughs> that do not want to comply, right? We're coming to that critical moment. So maybe we can end on that. First of all, um, is there anything I missed that's absolutely important for you to share here that you think is important for people to know going into the documentary, one? And two, let's talk about our role individually, collectively here, moving into 2024 and this harmonization perhaps with some of the strategies and tactics in the war uh, against the Elohim that JFK was involved in before this um, cover-up of his death. So two things, Jeff. Yeah, so we're we we are now, like I said earlier, it's it's like the fog is all lifting, and it is for me. I don't know. I, I think it is for everybody, and I, I everyone has this matter of fact uh, attitude now about all of this, whereas before they, they didn't believe it. Now it's mm -hmm. just matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're going to come to the realization that all the things that we think or fantasize that are going on are actually are going on yeah. and that once we come to that then we can extrapolate and see where this is all going but um the uh elohim don't really like to be exposed so um we're going to see where they take the next level of this thing i'm looking for some really high level trickery to go on um here by them to uh, fool us in some way. I have no idea what, what that would be. You um, mean like false flags, changing the channel on all of this? Uh, yep, okay. yep, yeah. yep. And um, so I'm looking for that, but I think at the same time, they can't do anything about what's happening. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it, it's something beyond them. It's something, it has to do again with the, the changing of the yugas and the newer age coming in and different kinds of way of thinking and, um, and more openness to ideas that we had than we had before, and um, and I don't think there's anything that they can do about it. Um, they didn't see JFK X coming. They went out of their way to discredit it. Um, I can't get any interviews with anybody. You're the only powered person that's interviewed me. Jeff Rents won't. I was on Jeff Rents probably a hundred times. Uh, in the past, I never asked for a penny. And uh, same thing with Jimmy Church. I never asked for a penny. He's on his show dozens of times, and not one of those guys will give me the time of day. I'm sorry, but you know, I feel I'm kind of pissed off about it. And um, and I said to writer, filmmaker, um, I said early on when we were making the film, I said, "You watch. Not one American will pay attention to this. It's going to be somebody who's not an American who's going to be the first person to come forward and talk about it. And sure as hell, that's exactly what happened. And I think it's because all I can tell you is this. All of the people from not America who have watched the film have been very appreciative of it and have written me and said, oh, my God, I finally get what's happening and all right. of that. The Americans, however, while they won't debate me, they refuse to debate me, they are very good at calling me names. So mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of uh, nasty emails from people calling me all sorts of names, and no, nobody will debate the facts, so, uh, you know. And so, you know, I, I understand where this was. I did that with the Kubrick and the moon landing. I know where this goes, and pretty soon it's just going to be matter of fact, and it's not going to be the boomers or the Xers. It's going to be the millennials who are going to be the generation just going to go, oh, well, yeah, that's what happened. And right. that'll be it. And it'll be over well, finally. Speaking to why perhaps you're not being interviewed by other sources, uh, I think you were privy to some of the conversations there. And uh, Cliff High tweeted this the other day, too, and how uh, – we were bribed here and we were kind of manhandled to stay away from some topics uh, last year. And I said, no, I'm just, I just want to do what I want to do. So uh, maybe the people you're talking about there to have controllers and handlers that don't let them get into some of these topics here. So this is why these mm -hmm. platforms are so important. And, uh, you know, I might not get it right all the time. I sure as hell don't. I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm, I'm going where the information is leading me. And I want to have, um, full autonomy on having these interviews um, and these conversations with people. And that's why that's so important. And that's why I'm, I'm so appreciative of everybody who supports us uh, on Beyond Mystic and here on Rumble. You guys are absolutely amazing. And so we have about 7,000 people watching now between all three platforms today on X, uh, YouTube, and on Twitter. We might have to delete this one from YouTube, <laughs> Jay. So I'll have to go and re-listen after the show, uh, but we'll leave it here for sure on, on Rumble. 
fascinating conversation again uh, congratulations and and jay there was a lot of people at the beginning of the show and i forgot to mention it, i was um handling two different slide decks today but in the chat people were saying how brave you are for putting this forward and i agree and uh i would i would suggest also that you're very brave for the second part of this interview also getting into the crux of the matter and the overarching issue uh, that really sets the stage for all of these conspiracy theories and where we're going uh, together as a human race. I think that's where a lot of our conversations need to go, even though we are being discouraged from having uh, those conversations. Jay, last words of wisdom before we go here today. Anything else you want to share with the audience members, uh, either about JFKX or about moving into 2024 and how to be a better versions of ourselves as humans? Uh, well, we are getting better and things are going to improve very rapidly and you're going to notice the improvement every day and it's going to get better and the truth is going to come shining through and they can't stop it. And I just want to say, uh, Jean-Claude, you're, you're amazing, man. I really, really, really appreciate you. And I, I know the hard work that you do to get this out. And I know the kind of pressures that you're under. Uh, I've been there and, um, and uh, you, uh, you may call me brave, but you're brave too, man. That's to do this every day like you do it. That's that's tenacious. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Jay. I really do. And coming from you, I really appreciate that. That makes uh, that makes me uh, warm in the heart and almost on the side of crying. So I think I'll say thank you uh, to you, Jay, and thank you to everyone joining. Oh, do you have anything else you want to add? Go ahead. Nope. No? Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Jay. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Please remember uh, to like, share, and subscribe. And leave us a comment. Let us know what you think about this crazy documentary, some of the opinions put forward, some of the evidence put forward here, and that, how that really changes our worldview moving forward and how it's uh, uh, important for each and every one of you watching the show here to pick up the baton, share this knowledge, share these documentaries with your friends and family, and uh, work together here to move forward uh, for humanity. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. This was, of course, the JFKX documentary documentary with Mr. Jay Widener and I'm Jean-Claude Abiyad Have a great day and we'll see you soon. Au revoir.